I invite you to take your Bibles once more and turn in the New Testament to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. We're picking up this morning with verse 19 and going down to verse 34. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 19. This is the word of our God. So let us give our attention to its reading. And this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. So they said to him, Who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we continue our study through the Gospel of John, we're still in our early stages looking here at the opening chapter, having looked over the previous three weeks at the prologue uh, that, that exalted Christ uh, um, in, his, in His divinity, that exalted and reminded us of who Christ is in His humanity, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We've given our attention to these verses and have come to see and understand the way it is that we receive grace upon grace upon grace when we receive Jesus Christ. We've learned about how Jesus brings full that Jesus being full of grace and truth is of the utmost importance to us. For we rely upon his grace and his truth every moment of every day. The Apostle John writes to encourage our belief in Christ. Jesus as the Messiah. He wants us to understand that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by by believing in His name, we have life. Indeed, the prologue that we've been studying is uh, is a deep well from which we can draw so many truths and come to understand more and more of our Savior. And as we leave it behind, I don't want us to think as though we're done with it. Reflect upon those first 18 verses on your own, but also know that they will come back up, for they lay out everything that we're to look at in this gospel, and so I'll make reference to them throughout our study together in this gospel. Well, throughout those opening verses, the Apostle John interspersed his his talk of Christ with the testimony of John the Baptist. And this continues in our passage today. In, in, in a sense, it continues by way of bringing John to the, fo- to the fore in order that he might testify. John is directly confronted by the leaders as they question him. And he gives his answers. He states his mission and he proclaims Christ. And throughout this entire inquisition, John teaches us what it is to be humble. Humility is not something that comes easily or naturally to us. It is often defined as a modest or low opinion of one's own importance 
And maybe that's true insofar as it goes. It's not true enough. It does not go far enough. Add to that the mistake that we often, we often think of quietness or self-loathing as humility and we find ourselves not really knowing what humility is. But John the Baptist teaches us what humility is. It is the proper view of Christ that puts everything else into perspective. When we know who Jesus is, when we understand who we are and who others are in the light of Jesus, this is humility. When we act in such a way as to understand who Jesus is, His greatness, His majesty, and who we are, His servants, this is humility. From John's humility, then, we see our call to the very same thing. And so we must understand John's perspective on Christ, that we too might emulate his humility. And so here we begin by uh, looking at our text together, and we see that, first of all, John the Baptist, I'm speaking of John the Baptist, is being recorded by John the Apostle, of course, and that those names will sometimes get sort of mingled, and I, I trust that the, le- that the listener will be able to distinguish those, but I will try as often as I'm able to remember that I'm, I need to distinguish that John the Baptist knows who he isn't. It begins here with those who came to ask him questions. It says, this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask you, who are you? Now, the first thing we want to ask is, who are these Jews? We'll get to their question of John in a moment. It's an important question. It's a driving question. But who are the Jews? In John's gospel, that is the apostle writing, he uses this term to denote those who oppose Jesus. It's often used to refer to those who are rulers, either political rulers or religious rulers. I mean, after all, John the Baptist is himself Jewish. John the Apostle is Jewish. Jesus is Jewish. The location that he tells us is likely helpful, that they are from Jerusalem. This is made even clearer in the parenthetical comment in verse 24. They had been sent from the Pharisees. They were not just any Jews out for a stroll wanting to ask John a question, but they were associated with the Pharisees. And so they sent these priests and these Levites to ask these questions. Well, the priests were of the Sadducees. So we have the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees, the Levites were those that were assigned to help them. We don't have time to delve into the history of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but as a, as a place marker, they arise during the intertestamental period between Malachi and Matthew. During that time, the Pharisees, they begin as a group of people who are separatists. They keep themselves free from legal contamination. And the Sadducees, they are sort of the, they're considered the ones that, that, that are members of the council, literally what the, the idea of Sadducee comes from. The Sadducees were known for their political power and their control of the priesthood. The high priest was from that line. So their connection with the Levites is also clear for they served the Sadducees. And the Pharisees themselves had a certain kind of power, but usually it was a populist kind of power, authority among, uh, over the people, the crowds. And so here they come, these Sadducees, these priests, these Levites, being sent by the Jews from Jerusalem, the Pharisees. They come and they want to understand who John is, what exactly is going on. They have heard enough, of course. We can can parallel this with other gospel accounts. They they have heard enough about something odd that had taken place roughly 30 years before the birth of one in Bethlehem. And so they want to know who John is and they're trying to ascertain exactly his relationship to what had happened previously and what they suspect is about to happen. They ask him, who are you? It's not a matter of introductions or his name. When they ask him, who are you? It's essentially they're asking, why are you baptizing? By what authority do you have to be baptizing for John to be calling the nation of Israel to repentance as he was doing? Who was he? To do such a thing. So John makes a very clear denial. In verse 20, uh, they had undoubtedly asked him, or, or at least he, he anticipates that they would ask him. He says, we read, he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Now that's kind of a clunky way to put it from our perspective. 
It's a very strong denial. In fact, it might be a little strong that we, we, we raise, it raises suspicions in our minds. One of those things that you protest perhaps too loudly. But I think what's going on here is that the Mosaic law said that uh, a, a matter was established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. And John, John is essentially witnessing for himself. He is making absolutely clear that he is not the Christ. You know, I do find it interesting that John's gospel begins with these three denials of John and it ends with Peter's three answers to Jesus' question of whether or not he loves him. I don't want to try and read too much into it, but there does seem to be a matter of humility that ties them both together. In both instances, the men know who they are and they both clearly proclaim Christ. Well, those who have come to question John and, and who he is, and he's given this denial about not being the Christ, he confesses, he does not deny, he confesses, I am not the Christ. They give him two more options. What then? Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? Now again, we have to understand why they would ask about these two individuals. Elijah was that Old Testament prophet who had battled the, pro the, the, the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings chapter 18, he is the one who was taken up in a whirlwind into God's presence without dying. There was a promise made that he would come again before the presence of the Lord. In Malachi 4 and verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And so they ask him, are, are you Elijah? And John says, I am not. Now that's interesting because we know that Jesus says that he is. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 13 to 14, Jesus says, For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. Was John wrong? Did John misunderstand it? Why did he deny it? There have been different ways that this has been wrestled with throughout church history. Some have said that there's really two comings of Elijah. There's one of Elijah coming in spirit, and then that was John the Baptist, and one of Elijah coming in the end in power, and that is not John the Baptist. For John's own purposes, for the purpose of John the Baptist, his, his father was told in Luke chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before them in the spirit and power of Elijah. So it comes down to whether or not maybe John was, say, was thinking of them asking, is he the Elijah that went up into heaven in that whirlwind come down? We know that that Elijah would make an appearance on the Mount of Transfiguration as he talked with Jesus. But it could also simply be a matter of John's own humility. He would not himself make the declaration, but Jesus would. Whatever the case we see very clearly that John is pointing them away from himself because his purpose is to point them to Christ. They ask him, are you the prophet? And notice here that they ask, are you the prophet? Perhaps in your own translation, it might capitalize the P. If it does, that's okay. It's not a prophet. It's the prophet, a particular prophet that was promised. In Deuteronomy 18 and verse 15 as Moses is preparing the children of Israel for his own departure, we read there, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. And so they're asking John, are you that prophet? Are you the one that was promised, the one that, that is like Moses? And we know, of course, that Jesus will be the one who is that prophet. He is the one like Moses. He is the one that God will say, this is my beloved son, listen to him. But John simply answers, no. He knows who he is not. He knows not to take more credit than he ought, than he even can. He is a servant of God. He is a prophet, and he likely understands that he is a prophet, but he is not the prophet. He is not the Elijah. He is not the Christ. So they ask him. They're exasperated. Who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? They're tired of guessing. They need to bring back an answer, and only John can give it to them, since they themselves seem to have no insight. This is John the, John the, the Apostle, that is the Gospel writer's way of bringing a, an indictment against the leaders of the day. 
Remember we read in chapter 1 in verse 11 about Jesus. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. One of the reasons why they don't receive him is because they don't see the one who points toward him. They don't understand who John the Baptist is. And the reason why they cannot see and this will be borne out throughout the entirety of the, of the gospel, it's their pride. It's the very opposite of John the Baptist, the one who is humble. It's their pride that they cannot see, that they will not see. They harden themselves like Pharaoh of old, refusing to see the hand of God at work. And so John gives an enigmatic answer. He says, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, the apostle John the Baptist is quoting here, from Isaiah 40, verses 3 to 5. And interestingly enough, he's quoting from the Greek translation of the Hebrew text, known as the Septuagint. But if you were to go and read those verses, verses chapter 40, verses 3 to 5, you'd actually notice a connection to our own topic of study. For the voice that is crying out is not drawing attention to himself, but to the Lord. Moreover, he speaks of every valley being lifted up and every mountain being made low. The coming of the Lord is connected with the very thing we're talking about, humility. John understands that it is God who brings redemption. John understands that he is the point to the one who is to come. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all the flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord is spoken. But the only way that you see it is if you are one of those hills that is made low, those valleys that have been lifted up. In other words, if you humble yourself before the Lord, He will exalt you. And what's more, though, is that John knew the ministry of Isaiah and what he was speaking. You see, when John identifies with Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 to 5, we, we fool ourselves to think that he's just looking at that, at that small snippet of Scripture. Remember the ministry of Isaiah. Remember how God said, who will go for us? Who shall we send? And Isaiah says, here I am, send me. And God says, go and say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes. Jesus will cite this passage from Isaiah in his own ministry with regard to the parables. So it makes sense that John would see himself in light of this. In other words, it's no surprise to John that here he is proclaiming Christ and they keep asking him, who are you? And he's saying, it doesn't matter who I am. And he continually points to Jesus. Christ himself would be rejected even as their line of questioning reminds us here. For as Martin Luther points out in this text, he says, if they truly thought that John was Christ, Elijah, or a prophet, they would have come themselves and been baptized. You see, their pride, their hubris is shown in the way that they even approach John, assuming that they can sit in judgment over him. But he is the one who has been commissioned by the Lord. He is the one who is pointing them to Christ. Well, they press on. They've been sent from the Pharisees and they ask him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? Well, the Gospel of John, we only read that he was baptizing. We don't actually get accounts of his baptism or of his, of his baptizing that we do uh, in Matthew, Mark, and in Luke. But it's interesting that they're asking him why he is baptizing. On what authority does he baptize? And perhaps they're even going for, far, even further than that because why would the Jews need to be baptized? Why would they be coming out from all of these places to be baptized by John? There seemed to be something wrong with it in their minds. You see, baptism was not unknown among the Jewish people. It was a self-administered uh, uh, um, um, action by Gentiles who became Jewish proselytes. In other words, those who professed faith in the Lord and wanted to join with the people of Israel at that time, whether they were Roman or of any Gentile descent, they would, they would, they would cleanse themselves. They would baptize themselves. We read of this in 2 Kings chapter 5 with regard to Naaman, who goes down to the pool, and after coming up from the pool and being cleansed of his leprosy, he takes a pot of earth and he brings it back with him, and he sacrifices only on that, signifying that he belonged to the people of God. But John was administering baptism himself. And those whom he baptized were already Jews. 
His was a baptism of repentance, which is another way of speaking of humbling oneself before God. You see how it all comes together? John was, was the humble one, and his baptism was a baptism of humility, a baptism of repentance. And the reason why they opposed it is because they were prideful. In fact, notice John's careful answer in verse 26. John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. There's that idea again, one whom you do not know. It's possible. Maybe Jesus was among them that very day. Maybe he was there at that time. Maybe as John was speaking, there was Jesus in the crowd as he was rebuking essentially these, these uh, priests and Levites. Given that verse 29 begins with the next day, some commentators see this in line with Matthew 3 where the rulers are confronted by John and he says, you brood of vipers. And immediately we read there, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. And so it's quite possible, as I said, that Jesus himself was there, the promised Messiah in the midst of them, and yet they neither knew him nor saw him, nor did they receive him. And worse than this, the vast majority of them never would know him. And why? It's because of their pride. But look at John. He who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. Now, John is not uh, boasting in his humility here. John is not entering into that kind of false humility that is truly pride, that is in hiding in a sense. No, the untying of a sandal was in fact the job of some servant in a house. It was a slave's task to undo his master's sandal as he entered the home. And it was considered the lowliest the most menial task that a slave could perform would be to take off the sandals and to wash the feet of his master. But John declares here his unworthiness. How different is this from the proclamation of the gospel among so many Christians that begin with man's worth. We repent of our sins because we are humbled by God's law and our failings. Like John, we are to see our place as unprofitable servants. Repentance. You see, this is what we go through each and every Lord's Day as we come into the presence of God. We repent of our sins. It calls us to go against the world, our own flesh, and the devil, whose pride was clear in Genesis chapter 3. What we're told here, this all takes place uh, in Bethany, across the Jordan where John was baptized. And it's the marker that tells us that John was, in fact, baptizing. And it's, it's, it's simply here, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. Just make, it's, it's essentially here to make, make clear that this is a historical fact. John was baptizing. Where he did it, the historicity of these things is important to believe. For without them actually happening, then our redemption has not actually been accomplished by Christ. Well, John knows who he isn't. John knows who he is. These, this, we could say, is one part of humility, focusing on self and understanding self. But we also know the other part, and that is that John knows who matters most. Look with me together. At, let's look together at verse 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Interestingly, John knew Jesus, knew who he was, being cousins uh, um, by, by their mother's relation. John knew Jesus growing up, but did not know him as the Christ. He knew Jesus, not though because of anything in him, that is, he knew that he was the Christ. He knew that he was the Lamb of God, not because of anything in him, but because it had been revealed to him by God as John leapt in his mother's womb, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now we want to pause for a moment and understand what John means when he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This Lamb of God imagery is used throughout Scripture. The Lamb imagery is used to speak of, of, of that animal that would be sacrificed in the place of mankind or a place of, of, of Israel for the sake of their sins. 
We find it, of course, in Genesis 22, though it's a ram, but it's the same imagery. It's a ram caught in a thicket in Genesis 22 so that Isaac would not be sacrificed. In Exodus chapter 12, it's the lamb that is slain and the blood put upon the doorpost and the lentils in order to, to, uh, um, um, in order to allow Israel to not face the angel of death. It's in Isaiah 53, the lamb that is led to the slaughter like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. There, of course, the Lamb of God, Isaiah 53, is the suffering servant. We see in Revelation chapter 5, again, that language of the Lamb that was standing as though it had been slain. Revelation 5 and verse 6. So when John sees Jesus and declares, Behold, the Lamb of God, he's picking up on this imagery that we find throughout the Old Testament that's associated particularly with the forgiveness of sins. And that's exactly what he says, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now the language of taking away, it means to take up and to bear away. It's very similar to the idea of the scapegoat in Leviticus 16. You remember that uh, on the Day of Atonement where there were two lambs, one that was offered up as an offering to, to satisfy the wrath of God and the other upon whom the sins were laid and was led away to, to die in the wilderness. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He does this by, by taking it upon himself. He is the Lamb of God that bears our sins. Indeed, he bore our sin for us. And so he also bears it from us. Matthew Henry, commenting on this passage, he says, It is our duty with an eye of faith to behold the Lamb of God taking away the sin of the world. See him taking away sin and let that increase our hatred of sin and our resolutions against it. Let not us hold, fast, hold that fast which the Lamb of God came to take away. For Christ will either take our sins away or take us away. Let it increase our love to Christ who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. John the Baptist sees Christ and makes this declaration and he makes it clear that he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, setting up, of course, everything that is to follow in the Gospel of John. But here is John in his humility. Though those, those leaders and those rulers did not know, did not recognize, would not accept Christ, John the Baptist was raised up for this purpose. We read in verse 30, This is he of whom I said, after me comes the, a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. This is the whole reason that John the Baptist is raised up. The whole reason that, 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 that God had, had come to Zechariah, his father, to Elizabeth, his mother, uh, that Gabriel had made the announcement to them both, that, 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 that zap, saps us of joy. But John shows us the way. There is no sorrow in his voice, only joy. His purpose is to reveal Christ. His humility is not one that leaves him low, but one that lifts him up as he exalts Jesus Christ. Again, Martin, Martin Luther writes on this passage, he says, This then is the, office, the other office of John and of every preacher of the gospel, not only to make all the world sinners, as we have heard above, but also to give comfort and to show how we may get rid of our sins. This he does in pointing him, pointing to him who is to come. Hereby he directs us to Christ, who is to redeem us from our sins. How utterly vital it is for every servant of Christ to refer others to Jesus and away from himself. This is John's task. John knew it was revealed to him by God himself what it was he was to do. The purpose for his baptism was to prepare for the one who would baptize with the Holy Spirit. We'll have more to say about that as we come to the upper room discourse in John 17 and the promises of Jesus. But notice John's concluding point. I have seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God. John saw the Spirit descend upon Christ and remain upon him. 
He heard the one who sent him to baptize and what he had said and, and, and how he was to point to Christ. And now he knows this is the Son of God. John understood himself. He understood his call. He understood his own person. He understood Christ, his glory, his sacrifice. He understood all others in relation to all of that. This view of himself, of Christ, and of others is essential to understand. For you, you see, beloved, if we are big and others, including Christ, are small, then we are prideful. If others are big and we, along with Christ, are small, then we become fearful. Only when Christ is exalted and all else, all others, are seen in the light of His greatness and we ourselves are seen in relation to Christ can we be confident in the Lord. You see, this is what allowed John to be confronted by those leaders, by those who would, who would try to put him down or even tempt him to raise himself up. John knew who he was. He knew who he wasn't. But he knew who matters most. It's Jesus Christ. This, beloved, is what God's people are called to. This is our relationship to Christ. He must increase. We must decrease. And we must rejoice that He increases. We must rejoice that He is the Son of God. That He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We do not draw near to God claiming any personal merit of our own. But rather, we come humbly, repenting of our sin, seeing ourselves in relation to Christ and Him only, and rejoicing in His goodness. For Christ is exalted. Christ is lifted up. And so we are saved. And we can have that, that walk with the Lord. And we can see all others, whatever we might face in this life, when it's placed in that right relation, in that right light, no matter who might rise up against you, no matter what might happen, if you are Christ and He is yours, He must increase. You must decrease. But you also rejoice that He is the Son of God.